Hey, Magni, you want to take us over and show us what we're working on? Here. Yeah, go show us. We're going that way, buddy. Come on. You know what we're doing. No, nope. <laughs> he doesn't know what we're doing. Hello and welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is the Questionable Garage and this is my 1970 Plymouth Sport Satellite. It's a dream car of mine. I've got, it, excuse me, Magni, I'm doing the intro. You hear the word dream car thrown out a lot with different automotive creators, basically anything from a Civic to a McLaren, it's their dream car. I'm gonna classify it. The Supra is my end all be all favorite car. It's my forever car. But when it comes to muscle cars, despite building try hard, I am not an A-body Mopar guy. That just kind of happened. I am a 1970, specifically 1970 B-body Mopar guy. I think, hands down, it is the absolute best looking of all muscle cars. I'm not saying other cars didn't look good, but there's just something about the proportions of this car. They're incredibly big posterior, and it's just, I don't know, they're menacing looking to me. And what I actually like about, what? We're trying to do intros and explain cars, Magni. Do you remember that adorable little puppy that we got in an O'Reilly ad? This is him, and he's an absolute terror. Now, when you think B-body Mopar, most of you go to the 68, 69 Chargers, the 70 Chargers, and I do like the Charger, but those are almost a little too aggressive. What I liked about the Plymouth Sport Satellites, the Plymouth Roadrunners, they're a little bit softer. And what I like about it is instead of being like just in your face screaming, it's like if you suddenly just felt that slight breath on the back of your neck, or you just feel like something's over your shoulder being just looming over you, and you turn around and you jump because you're startled by the sudden appearance, that to me is the sports satellite. I absolutely love the look of it. And I really wish I wasn't so much in love with the 1970. It's a one year only body style with nearly half the production of all the other cars, and pretty much everyone turned sports satellites into Roadrunner clones or Superbird clones. So a sports satellite's not very common. Now you may be asking yourself, Jared, why do you have it in the shop right now? You've got lots of other projects going on and you're right. We got to get Earl fixed up for Indy. We've, there's just, there's way too much going on. But with each project, we eventually hit a parts wall. We run out of parts for one car, so we're able to bring something else in. Magni, out of the garbage can. And today's a really exciting day on the sports satellite here. We are going to get this front suspension fixed up on the car. If you don't remember way back from the initial intro, we're gonna show you again just how bad some things are in this front suspension. It makes moving it around an absolute nightmare. And I've got some really good parts to put into it. And then by the end of this episode, we're gonna kind of show you some of the other direction we're doing with this car. Some of you are upset that I don't do pretty cars. I don't always like pretty cars, but I want this one to be one. And we are going to be doing over the course of the build, an astronomical amount of work, both inside and out, to make this the ultimate country cruiser. We go on cross-country drives, we go on just whatever drive we want. I want this to be as modern and as true to the vintage self as possible. But that's enough of me just standing around. Let me pick you guys up and let's go take a look at the parts we got. Of course, when we're talking muscle car and we're talking suspension, is there a brand other than QA1? We have got, now you come over, buddy. Let me guess, you're gonna pee on the box again. We've got their full level three front end, their lightweight tubular K member to go into it, and we got some rear shocks. Now, some of you who remember Project Try Hard, I said rear shocks. We had to go to the four link in the back of Try Hard to get that rear end under control for the road racing and the autocross. It just did not work well on leaf springs. B-body Mopars, it's a little bit easier to get a better leaf spring, and I'm not looking for that hard-tuned, aggressive handling car. We're looking for a cruising car, and while we can get that with the coilovers and everything, I wanted to show you, you didn't have to always throw all the money at it. 
and I may end up regretting it just like we did in Try Hard, and I may be calling up QA1 and, you know, trying to get stuff sent quickly. But that's, that's not the goal. Cruiser, rear leaf springs, good QA1 shocks in the back, and their fancy stuff up front. It also lets us get those Mustang 2 style spindles, which opens up our brake options. That's a lot of boxes. Let me pick the car up and remind you why there, there's maybe a need for some pretty major suspension work. Here goes the lift shot that we put in every one because it fills up some episode time. Magni, why are you so worried? You've been around a car going up on a lift. It's okay. You did not like that, did you? No, you didn't. Come on, hand truck. Oh, oh flat tire. Oh, ah. Pick up the box. So if we come up in here, if you remember when we pushed this in, this wheel was kind of just doing whatever it wanted. It was being very cattywampus. And that is because instead of a lower ball joint assembly, we have a lower bolt assembly. That is not how it should be. Uh, very wrong. And you know, a practical thing, a simple thing would be to get the correct lower tie rod set up lower ball joint set up, and we could put this K-member back together. But our spindle's also damaged, they broke bolts off in it, and it's just a general mess. So if I'm gonna have to do a lot of work, why not make it better? Now, what you get when you're replacing one of the full front suspensions with something modern, these are called a lot of things in the import world, we call them caster struts. I can't remember what they call them in the, muscle car world, but basically this keeps your knuckle from swinging forward and back. You got your upper control arm, your lower control arm, and then for steering, most all the modern vehicles we work with have rack and pinions. We'll show you that later. This has a multi-link steering setup that goes to a steering box. So that's your steering box. Your steering shaft goes into that. That connects to a pitman arm here, which then connects to a drag link you have an idler arm, and then you have your tie rods. So when you start looking at all of these pieces, it's very easy to develop a tremendous amount of steering slop. You can have free play in the steering box. All of these joints can be worn out. And while it can make for a comfortable, smooth ride, it doesn't make for a good handling ride. Now, the other thing we've got to work around are our new coilovers are gonna replace these. These are torsion springs. It's a straight rod made out of spring steel. And that is what controls and regulates the balance of the suspension. Or basically that's what the car sits on, the shock. Regulates your springs, your springs controls how the car goes over bumps. And again, very good for comfort and you can make them handle very well. But it's older technology. Why not jump, you know, 50 years newer and put really nice modern shocks on it with really good coilovers, uh, you know, coilover spring. That's that's what we're gonna do. So our goal is to get the front suspension under this thing so it can roll and move a little bit easier. And once we're all done with that, then we can start talking about some of that, some of that. We, we paid a visit to Auto Metal Direct and there's, there's a lot of boxes. So removing torsion bars, you do need to be careful because they are under spring tension. You got simple, locking sir clips in the back here. They're really nice because you can just grab them with pliers. That's to prepare us for step two. Or I guess 2.1. Get those out. Magni's probably off peeing somewhere again. All right, so you can see this bolt here. You've got one on each side. This is what preloads the key and that's what your torsion bar locks into. You can adjust ride height some with it. You can lower it by tanking tension out, but also doing that with torsion bars, you remove preload so you can change the ride quality. But to get these relatively safe to knock out, we're just gonna knock these preload, all the preload out. Get covered in rust and uh, undercoating. Wow, these bushings are uh, not. So normally on your steering box, there's a roll pin you gotta knock out. That's not even there for us. All right, tension's out and I'm 
82% sure they go backwards. So I will grab a punch and a hammer and let's find out. Maggie, what are you doing to the bathroom? I laid the futon down so he can watch better. He seems to be enjoying that more. Oh yeah, that's working. You know when you think you know something, but you don't 100% know it, but you're like, you know, like, I think this is right, and it doesn't work, you start to question yourself, your sanity, but then it turns out you were right. I feel good. I mean, it's working some. I wonder if they, if you know, comment below if they have vice grips with the teeth turned 90 degrees so that way when you're trying to like do something like this hammer against them it'll bite in because the teeth of the vice grip are designed to keep you from rotating not necessarily you know doing what i'm doing it's working it is coming out and we're being less destructive because i know there was like one of you out there that desperately needed Slant 6, A-body Mopar torsion bars, and you were very upset with me for cutting them. There we go. Look, we didn't destroy it. Feels good every once in a while to just not be destructive. So what's your favorite muscle car? I mean, not to be rude. If it's not a 70 era Mopar. I know there's gonna be some Chevelles, there's gonna be some Novas, of course the Camaro. Here's an interesting one. Is the Corvette a muscle car or is it just a sports car? That's a good one to argue. Really to me back in the day it fits more sports car than muscle car because they kind of were gearing it for handling and performance where muscle cars were just ludicrous power and terrible chassis. I really wish I was like more into the Camaros or the other cars because the Mopars, they made the least amount of them when you really look at like overall production numbers and uh, they all rusted away. <laughs> or because you know Chevy and Ford dominated early desirability they just kind of all got destroyed like they didn't survive so in turn you take already low production numbers mix in you know the 80s no one really caring about them and it just becomes ridiculous how expensive things are There you go, two strings out. Next up is upper control arms and cradle bolts. So I'm gonna finish clearing off the table and we'll tuck it under here. We'll get our control arms out and uh, liberate the old stuff and then build out the new stuff and talk about it. Now, let's cross our fingers. This is got rust in it, but let's hope it's a Southern rusty car. It's not really rust, it just kind of looks like rust. All right, that came right out. Let us see. Again, this might just anger everyone up north. Sorry guys. <laughs> I don't even think your new cars will come apart that good. This one's 1970. And it's just rusted because it's Mopar, pretty much. I'm glad it's behaving a little bit considering just how much of this is just blind. So I can fit. We get a pry bar. Yeah, well, that'll be the smart thing. Maybe I should get a bigger pry bar. Keep my hands safe. Oh, wow, that one too. Well, that, that ball joint feels good. I don't know, can you hear it? Let's see. 
ball joint shouldn't sound that way. Also, some of you may ask, why am I putting all the suspension in if I'm most likely going to take it out when it's time to paint? Well, I need it to roll around. And it does not roll around on this stuff. And it's not that hard to pull these. Feel on just the frame rail right now. Feels nice and good. Just clean it up and treat it. Sweet. Now, K-member bolts. One and a sixteenth. Also, these are special bolts. If you see that big shoulder, the QA1 cross members, and I think pretty much every aftermarket cross member is designed to reuse these. So if your bolts aren't good, you're gonna need to get reman or you know reproductions of that. All right, I think I learned the steering box. We're free, except for that one thing I forgot. But because I forgot it, I don't know what it is. All right, we have got the K-member on the table. I still don't know. I guess it kind of sort of looks like a weird K. What do you think, Magni? What are you, you going to tell the viewers? Nothing. Okay. So, <laughs> so again, once it's out, you can see we've got apparently a lucky penny. No clue how long that's been. These are the motor mounts. This is that steering box, and it is extra, extra deluxe because it is power steering. They're almost half this size if it is a manual steering car. Something else, we were talking about that free play adjustment, or the free play you can get in the rack. I don't think I have the torque to turn the input shaft by hand. But this is your preload setting of your worms and your balls and your doomahickeys in there. So you would loosen that and you can tighten it. But if you tighten it too much, steering doesn't work. So it's a fine balance. And again, we were looking initially at that. That should not be a bolt. It should look a little bit more kind of like that right there, a ball joint. And then you have those studs, which are broken off over here. I don't know. Can you hear it? Here, I'm, I'm going to put the microphone close. So that's worn, that's worn and shot, that's worn and shot. So rehabbing this would take a lot of parts. Instead, we've, we've got a lot of goodness there. I'm gonna get started unboxing all of that. I'm just gonna time lapse it for you and then we're gonna talk about it once it's on the table and we're gonna put it together with this giant monstrosity next to it so we can show the improvements, show the weight changes and everything that you gain by going, you know, I'm trying to do math in my head. 50 years in the future? No. Uh, 30, 54 years in the future. Although technically rack and pinion steering started showing up in the 80s. I think some in the 70s. Not on a muscle car though. We're making a muscle car handle like something a little more modern. Since the new K member incorporates the shocks and the bump stops internally, you need to remove the factory bump stops. They've got these giant funky spot welds. What I like to do is kind of cut as much of it off and then come back with a flap wheel and just gently sand it down. I find that tends to give you a little bit cleaner result, uh, less cutting into the frame. Some people, again, will just drill weld or drill right out. I've seen people attack straight with an air hammer. Not, not my preference. Sorry, guys. Ah, 
was aggressive. Now to finish getting those off. You get the idea, it's loud. I don't want to keep blowing your ears out. So I'll pick you up once these are off in our next step. Hey Magni, you want to tell the guys what we did? What did we do? Yeah? No, that's not quite what we did. So we have got, let me get around to where you can see, we've got all of the bump stops removed and I did end up moving to the um, air hammer method. So I need to weld a little bit where it peeled out. So I've got the copper coat on for right now. Otherwise we're looking really good on this side. Notice I said on this side, I found something that's a little bit of a bummer. A lot of times in classic cars, Chevys, Fords, any sheet metal replacement is considered a detriment to value because they always want original metal. A lot of the Mopars seem to come pre-rusted and pre-defects, and they require generally a lot of sheet metal. AMD, there's a couple versions of Mopars that you can just order from a catalog. Basically, you don't even need a car or a VIN number, and you can build it from scratch. I'm saying that just to kind of, you know, get ready. I got this thing in hopes, you know, it's solid. It is a very good solid base, but I found something I'm a little bummed to see. The Mopar K-Member cracks. We are cracked right there. We've got a little bit of rust pinholes there. Really... If we're being totally honest, not the absolute end of the world. I can just drill out the cracks, weld there, and do a little bit of filler welding on the small pinholes of rust. But I am trying to build this like I'm chasing a good level of perfection. So again, a very suitable repair for this. Camera here. Thank you. Again, suitable repair with this crack is we would drill through right here, we would drill through right here. And the reason you drill is it stops the fault line of the cracks. If we just came in and welded this, the steel is still technically stressing in that crack and is going to continue. The thing where I'm not 100% right now, what I'm going to do is, do I want to get new frame rail? I can get a new frame rail. It's a tremendous amount of work, but then it's 100%. On the flip side, patching and welding and correcting that, that, that is a perfectly acceptable and very good repair. There's nothing wrong with that. That is an almost expected repair on these cars. So I'm, I'm on the fence. We're still gonna go ahead and get our QA1 front end installed on this. We're not doing that repair right now because we've got a lot of sheet metal to do in the future and I'm just trying to make this roll around a little bit easier until that time comes, I'm torn. What would you do? Tell me below, knowing that I want this thing to be as nice as possible, buttoned and finished, it will be getting an interior unlike a lot of cars. Do I do the perfectly acceptable patch and repair of what we've got or do I do a whole frame rail? Give me your opinion. But either way, we are going to go ahead and get the K-member bolted up, and then we're going to get the rest of the suspension bolted to it so we can uh, get our satellite rolling around just a little bit easier. So I'm basically going to go ahead and set the K-member in bare, more or less, and we're going to build it on the car. Um, that's an interesting discovery. Steak knife, murder weapon, we'll put that right back there. Who knows? Instead of building the whole thing out to just keep the weight down, um, where I normally will just he-man stuff around, we're gonna go ahead and slide the K-member up, get it bolted down, build up the lower control arms the rack, get the upper control arms in, and then we'll go from there. Just trying to, you know, be a little smarter at times. Not always, but sometimes. Oh, come on. There we go. Ow. There we go. 
That was easy-ish. Easy no, it wasn't. This will make my engine install and my header install and the rest of life really easy. It's nice putting pretty parts on the car. Ow! Don't put your face in the way of your electric ratchet. That hurt. When you're doing a project that you're like super excited for and you finally get around to like the pretty parts install, is there anything better? Because one thing that is good, that K member could have been bent. We don't know, especially with the slight, you know, crack in the frame. We don't know 100% what's going on with this. This, which is built off a jig off of factory measurements and bolts into many, many different B-body Mopars, bolted right in. So, at the end of the day, it's square, in theory. So, hey buddy. We'll put together some control arms. I'm going to give Magni a quick walk and uh, we'll get back to it. Get some rear shocks thrown on. I had a wrench. It's in my pocket. Pretty close to dead. I'm gonna run the heck out of it. Apparently it doesn't like old rusty stuff. I can't really blame it. Okay. Ratchet. Look, the Chris Fix. Hey guys, Chris Fix here. Let's see how it does. I mean, the logical thing would be four link and all, but I really do not want this, you know, to be like the hardened, crazy, you know, more or less race car that, uh, Try hard is. Try hard was built for a very specific purpose. And he really needed the four link. The purpose this is being built for doesn't demand a four link. Let's see, how worn are these? Anytime now. Yep. Mm hmm. That's supposed to go back out. Okay, so definitely shot. There we go. So this is where you have to decide. Do you want your adjusters in or out? If you go out, they're pointed right at the spring. Whereas when you go in, you actually kind of can get to them. So I personally am a point them in kind of guy. Well, that explains why that wasn't threaded on very far. It's the wrong pitch. This poor car, we're just finding all kinds of little issues with it. Good news is, we can make it better. What have you guys been working on, on in your garage? Any cool projects? Any, any big milestones? Getting close to your first startup, first drive? Or are you just looking at it as a whole and kind of feel overwhelmed? I'll tell you, that's, that happens a lot. If you just look at everything you have to do, project cars can get very overwhelming. So I recommend just try to tackle little things at a time. Plus, when you set a lot of small goals, instead of just that one giant victory at the end, you get to have, you know, 50 victories along the way. 
a little more fun. And now I see what they talk about. In the install instructions of that four link, they tell you if you've got a uh, B body, you might have to remove the shock cross member. And I didn't get it at first. And again, you may say, why are you putting on parts that you're just going to end up taking off? I've always tried to dry build vehicles, basically. Make sure your good stuff fits, does what it's supposed to. So that way when it's pretty and shiny is not when you're suddenly discovering you got a mismatch somewhere. This one's blown even worse than the other side. Oh, doesn't even have full travel because it's so dented and damaged. go to the hardware store that means I can pick up some parts because I wanted to make a little demonstration hopefully it can work pretty good that short of shows what the shock is doing in relation to the spring like you hear the shock controls the spring but what exactly is it controlling and I have an idea I don't know how well that idea translates but we'll try it Boom, all right, we'll be back after a hardware store run. All right, we are back from the hardware store and this is, well, it's what I thought of as a quick demonstration of kind of what a shock is doing. Now, one thing I do wanna to address too, we're doing a basic layman's explanation. I love getting way off into the weeds in the nitty gritty technical and just the insane science of it all. And for the maybe thousand of you that also like going off and playing in the woods with me, our goal here is to educate and try to get everyone excited. Whenever you meet someone new in the automotive space or just slightly automotive curious, if you throw everything at them at once, you kind of scare them, overwhelm them, and they're not going to ever come out and play in the weeds with you. So we give them a little bit of information, get them curious and excited to join us in the weeds. So the simplest word definition of a shock absorber's job in a suspension is to dampen or control the spring. You hear that and it's hard to visualize what it's actually doing. That's why I wanted to kind of sort of, you know, make a demonstration. We got a door stop. I've got some springs and I've got some elastic from one of these tie downs. These are our shock absorbers, at least in this example here. Now in a vehicle suspension, we would be compressing the spring, but creating this example with a compression of a spring would be very difficult. So a spring oscillating is still gonna give us that same effect because spring steel, whether it's wiggling back and forth or being compressed and returning, it's going to be relatively the same example. First, let's, let's pull out this nice cute little baby coil over. The reason this is called a coil over is you have your shock absorber and then the spring sits over it as a whole assembly. You can bolt this in and you have your spring and your shock in one. Whereas if you go back to the back of suspension, we have the leaf springs and the shocks bolt in independently. And again, in the front, we were missing the shocks, but you have torsion springs and the shocks live separately. Now we're not gonna go down the rabbit hole of, you know, McPherson, all of this stuff. We're just wanting to talk about the shock absorber's job. What is it doing? What shock is it absorbing? And that's where it can get a little complicated because you would think when you hit a bump in the road, that big old pothole that's gonna bend your really pretty rim, that's not the shocks job the spring absorbs that energy in impact and the shock then will take that energy away from the spring and keep it from oscillating what do i mean by oscillating well your little door stop what was fun about it it would keep wiggling now i have weight at the top so it takes a little bit of that wiggle out but you would uh and it just vibrates for a while and it's kind of fun your cats 
sometimes your dog, or again, you will just sit there and play with this. Uncontrolled spring energy. But when it comes to the action of a shock absorber, you have two movements. You have compression, when that suspension is moving up and pushing the sock in, and then you have rebound. That's when the shock is returning back and pushing away from that compressed state. Now, it's not just the shock. Obviously, your spring is compressing and rebounding. We get into the type of adjustable, and this is where we're gonna touch just a little bit on it to avoid those deep weeds. If you notice, compared to the shocks we installed, this only has one knob. That means it's a single adjustable shock absorber. We cannot control the rate at which the shock compresses and rebounds independently. Installed in the vehicle, we have double adjustable. We can let it compress differently and rebound at a different rate. Again, we're not gonna go into the reasons why you potentially want to go into and have a shock maybe not collapse as quickly to fight that spring energy harder and then spring back faster, or maybe you want it to compress really quick and then come back slowly. And then there's a whole different level of shocks that have low speed and high speed adjustments. So that way if it's small ripples and then high speed ripples, you know, like a real big hole versus small suspension, it's a whole different thing. We're not talking about that. What is the shock doing to the spring? If we look at my example here, an unregulated spring, we're gonna take it and you just see how it wiggles around, uncontrolled, and it takes a second or two to finally stop. Now, we are going to install these shocks. Shocks. First, I'm gonna throw it on the ground. And the first setting we're gonna go for is a minimal adjustment, minimal control. So as you can tell, there's a lot of free play here, which would mean when we're talking about the level of dampening, this is basically like a two, very little control, but it is there. So if we take our spring, and you notice how much faster it stops. Again, comparison, no shock absorbers. We're gonna to touch the board, how much it wiggles around. And we're gonna reinstall our shock absorbers. I gotta install them in the right way. But again, we get basically two oscillations and then it's tied back up. Now, what if we were to tighten our shock absorbers? Like one thing I can very confidently reference is for drag racing, QA1 recommends all, basically darn near maxing out your compression. QA1 shut their shocks up a little bit different than some other companies in that generally you want your spring to be the primary control, but they then also have a really good design in their shock absorber. And I'm not saying other companies don't, I just have experience with QA1, so I'm referencing them where you can use that shock absorber to also fine tune suspension. So with try hard driving over to the drag racing staging lanes during the events with Holly, they suggested, again, basically maxing out your compression. I did that and the car felt almost broken. Like as you're driving over small bumps in the staging lanes, you can feel the car just bouncing in the rear because that shock is so tight, it is not letting that spring really compress much at all. And the big reason you want that for drag racing is as you start to accelerate, you don't want your spring to collapse because that allows the rear end to go up. Your body will then slam down against it and you can bounce. Whereas when you have that hard shock setting where it takes more effort to compress, you're actually taking that energy and instead of collapsing a shock and spring, you're driving your tire into the ground for acceleration. So we've now increased our spring rate we're gonna take our spring to the same point. And you see, we get one big oscillation and then just a couple small ones. Now, because of the extreme length, I really can't utilize my most extreme setting, but we will try it. I don't think, there we go, okay. So this is basically your shocks maxed out. And you see, we don't even get one big, oscillation. That spring comes over, boom, it's upright. I hope this kind of helps visualize a little bit more when we say a shock controls spring energy. It dampens the spring energy. The weight of the vehicle is supported by your springs, the initial impacts, 
and bumps in the road, the springs handle all of that, and a shock absorber's job is to dampen and control the spring. That's why you often hear them referred to as dampeners, because they're dampening a spring. All right, so we have got suspension under our sport satellite that is gonna make it handle and ride amazing. I'm really excited overall. Honestly, we did find that big bummer of a crack in the frame rail. You know, why can't I like a more plentiful car that, you know, isn't just expected to need all of its metal replaced? Because none of them look this cool. That, that is why. Now, when it comes to front fenders, we're doing body work. You cannot get these things. That is basically non-existent. It is one year only. But most every panel on this, we can get thanks to our friends at AMD. And I have a whole lot of it. Uh, I showed you a little bit of it. I think I've got a really cool picture that I'll have Dwayne put in right here. Um, yes. Even though these rear quarter panels have had rust patches done and we have the parts to kind of patch through here, this is the once in a lifetime muscle car build. I'm not gonna build really many more of these. We're gonna go after the Supra, and some of the other cars that also I really enjoy. Oh man, look how good that looks. The other benefit is because of those steering arms back there, it makes big headers. It just makes everything way easier for the big block to go in. Do we get started on all of the metal work or do we get this bad boy built? This is a Motorhome 440. It is confirmed to run when I picked it up, but we're gonna do higher compression pistons, probably get some aluminum heads, get it a little bit hot rotted, nothing extreme. And I do have a perfectly running car 440 and 440 trans that I bought to put in this thing, but you guys crucified me for the New Yorker. Again, we're gonna get that thing buttoned up a little bit more and I'm going to confirm with a uh, trusted legal house and we'll do a giveaway with that at some point. Coming up, you guys can win it and make it your own problem. Uh, so I got a whole new 440 to build for the satellite and the New Yorker lives on. But again, let me know, what do you wanna see me tackle next on our satellite? Are we doing the engine build and we're just gonna make it run and drive then start on the bodywork or do we go ahead and just blow it completely apart and work on the bodywork again we're kind of rotating projects a little bit we're gonna be getting back on the Ferrari truck here in a second as soon as parts are here we've got to get Earl updated with different camshafts so we can do better at Indy we have got Honda Rousey we're doing little bits of everything we're making progress on all of the projects as parts allow so that way uh, they all get running and driving and having fun but man, part of me just really wants to just make this drive as is. Because <sighs> it really is not my favorite muscle car. So I'm, I'm excited to be making progress on it. Don't tell me to make a Roadrunner clone or a Superbird clone. There's enough of them. I'm going to keep it a sport satellite. Keep it looking just like it does because I like it. And if you're looking for some suspension upgrades for your ride, check out QA1. I'll have a link in the description below. Head over there. They've got a whole lot of really great just custom shock lengths. You can get just about anything you want on some QA1 shocks. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm a big believer. I absolutely love how they've performed on all of my cars so far. So uh, yeah, you should check them out. But yeah, I'm Jared reminding you guys to always make questionable choices and don't be afraid to chase your dreams. You're dreaming for it, why not? Why not go for it? We'll see you.